Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this week into the comp video, we're going to be going into a session hosted by AMD, which was recorded by TechArp, where AMD's Jeffrey Chang went in to give us more of an insight into how Vega's memory architecture works. There are a couple of things before I start on this video. One, memory and how address space works and so on is quite a complex topic. For the sake of this video, I'm going to keep things pretty simple. Um, which means that it might not be 100% um, accurate enough for people super technically inclined, but for the average person, it's going to at least give you an insight into what this stuff means. The reason I'm putting this video out is because quite a few people messaged me or emailed me asking, like, what does some of this stuff actually mean? How is it going to benefit them as gamers rather than high-end data centers and that type of stuff? And the second thing is that we've already had an exclusive interview with Scott Wasson from AMD. So if you want more in insight into some of this stuff that we have talked about with Scott before, then by all golly gosh means you can check out the link in the video description. And I've also linked the session, which was once again recorded by Tech Arp. That's tech as in T-E-C-H and then Arp as in A-R-P. And that will also be linked in the video description. So let's begin. I think it's fairly well understood by now that Vega isn't just Polaris, but with higher clock speeds. There are some deep and meaningful changes which aren't just, you know, HBM2 uh, bolted on. We've discussed, for example, the fact it has programmable geometry pipelines, which include new primitive shaders, an intelligent workgroup distributor. We have things such as the next generation compute units, also known as NCU, which offer 128 32-bit ops per clock, 256 16-bits per clock, or the one that a lot of people are interested in, 512 8-bit ops per clock, if you don't need that level of precision. There are a whole bunch of other stuff as well with the Pixel Engine, such as drawstring binning rasterizer, changes to the back end with the... Um, with how the ROPs interact with the level 2, which means that uh, deferred shading is going to be a lot more efficient and faster. But with all of that said, for this video, we're going to be focusing on HBM2, memory, and the HBCC, also known to its friends as High Bandwidth Cache Controller. So just so we've got the groundwork down. HBM2 offers two times bandwidth per pin, five times the power efficiency of GDDR5, eight times the capacity per stack over the older generation, and 50% smaller footprint. That, by the way, means that it takes up less room on the PCB. Well, the high bandwidth cache controller, according to AMD, which I will be stressing throughout this video at the end of the day, I'm not testing Vega myself at the moment, has access to 512 terabytes of virtual address space and adaptive fine-grained data movement. So, with all of that said, what does it actually mean? Well, once again, Jeffrey from AMD did give us some information, so I'm going to read out some of the stuff. I won't uh, embed the video because he did kind of go through things in a roundabout way. So I'm going to take very specific quotes or very specific piece of information and uh, just kind of cut through the gump. Anyway, so why don't graphics cards just add in more RAM? Like, why can't you just go from 32 gigabytes to 64 gigabytes, just for example? Well, according to AMD, they took a deeper look of this and they realized it's not just adding additional memory and it's one of the reasons that Raja Kodori has constantly said they want to focus more on the bandwidth con bandwidth concern now obviously some of this is definitely marketing spiel which is fair enough but it's without question that adding traditional DRAM onto any um, graphics card increases the power consumption and cost so what happens is that, if, especially if you're dealing with like data center type of usage scenarios, memory power consumption is actually secondary only to running like CPUs or processors, like the GPU processor itself, which is just bonkers. So DRAM also adds latency. So that's one of the reasons they're starting to shift to HBM2. Now, Therefore, AMD with Vega are starting to move towards the heterogeneous technology, which is something we've discussed a lot when it came to the next generation consoles. How this works is basically data is moved upon uh, to the current, um, to the GPU, into the resident memory, based upon the work that the GPU is running on the kernel. So what the hell does that mean? It simply means that as data is needed, 
it's shifted if it's not already resident on the graphics card it will be shifted in a fine grain manner to the gpu so in other words the graphics driver along with the graphics card itself will work along with the cpu to say okay this piece of data is next okay the cpu wants me to process this piece of data next uh, after i've worked on this piece so okay i know what's next in the queue i will the hpcc will move this to this so that i can process it after i finish with this hopefully that makes some sense so this works because data process is finite you know it, it can't work on everything at once whether that's a game whether it's um scientific research because after all if you want to figure out what the answer to c is in a mathematical question you need to know what you know the the preceding questions before it were sorry the previous questions before it were so scott wasson actually talked a bit about this to us in the interview we had which is um once again linked in the video description AMD also pointed out Radeon SSG, which is, according to AMD themselves, a new category of product. How it works is it connects a high bandwidth piece of memory to a 16-lane PCIe connection to a high-performance SSD. So it's a three-way connection, GPU, GPU memory, and host CPU. Now, it's very important to note that this memory technology, or rather the Radeon SSG, is not going to be used at any time soon for gaming. Uh, we'll go more into why that is and why memory um, with games is a problem, according to AMD. So, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. Jeffrey also made mention to SCM, also known as storage class memory, also known as persistent memory, which is coming up in the future. It's going to offer, according to AMD, better throughput and byte addressable access memory. This means you don't have to copy memory as it's accessed directly through byte address. Jeffrey is referring to this as a hybrid storage slash memory tier. To give you an example of how this works, if it's designed for a host CPU, in other words, let's say you own Skylake, just for example, it would plug directly into the DDR4 memory slot. So what is it exactly? Well, it acts as a combination of, I guess the best way of putting it is a is a SSD with a stick of memory. That's the best way of thinking it. So it's slightly slower than traditional RAM, in other words, DDR4 or what have you, but it has the benefit of offering up to more data, plus it will keep the data after power cycle. So let's say with your regular desktop, if you hold the power button, you know, switch it off, turn it back on, Windows has to reload. With this, it wouldn't do that. It would keep the data resident in memory. Now, this technology is moving on quite fast. For example, we have discussed XPoint in the past, which is a joint venture between Micron and Intel. It is boasted to offer hugely improved latency and up to ten, uh, sorry, one thousand times the endurance of Flash, and fast uh, and up to one thousand times faster to boot than Flash memory. It's created using phase change memory, which is a type of glass and two layers, which are sandwiched between a crossbar. Now we have talked about this before, so I don't want to focus too much on X point because it's not really the point of the video. But we can imagine how this is going to start being used in data centers and possibly games but we'll go into more into that in just a second so vega's memory system is pretty complex it's a traditional cpu has one access space for memory which is known as flat memory model gpus are coming later and therefore typically are um, running on a separate software stack which handles the allocation of virtual memory to the gpu and this is combined with the gpu's own memory just so we're clear Flat memory is memory addressing which appears to the application to be a single address space. It means application don't need to worry about separate techniques such as memory segmentation. I'm pretty much glazing over that because how memory access and uh, different memory models work is a quite complex topic. And honestly, it's well outside the remit of this video. So you can by all means do some Googling or maybe I'll uh, tackle it myself in the future. Um, Vega does have... 64-bit memory address space this is by shader instructions but vega does have full access to the cpu's 48-bit instruction space but there are remaining bits in other words it still has spare address for in, for its own internal registers and memory 
and according to AMD it does believe everything is flat i.e. one address space however some details Jeffrey refused to answer said that they're just not ready to disclose this stuff and some of it also goes to product tiers so I'm not quite sure how that works in reality so let's talk a little bit more about um, how this works so flexibility with the controller is how the heterogeneous memory is actually controlled and moved around including by the CPU the controller that's HBCC looks at the workflow in other words what the GPU is currently working on and then the controller works on that now it's imperative to realize that this is not some magical piece of hardware that you know operates independently of everything at the end of the day according to Jeffrey it's still being handled unsurprisingly by a dedicated driver this means that there is software implementation in place but it's not on the developers from what I'm reading and from what I'm hearing to handle this and we'll actually discuss this in just a second as well now this part is also quite key it's still early for them to run benchmarks showing that Vega A still needs a lot of work and B that means they don't really know 100% what differences it's going to make in today's games or you know future applications now, one of the reasons behind this is a lot of games simply don't upload a lot of data to the GPU. This is because most games developers handle memory allocation themselves. So what they do is they look and design a game based upon minimum specifications, right? So if a developer says, okay, this game requires a minimum of a GTX 770, and it requires four gigabytes of RAM, or it requires, you know, a GTX, I don't know, let's just say it requires a 7970 for recommended, then they will figure this out directly, and obviously based upon the settings you have in game, it will grab, you know, memory. So, for example, if you have higher quality textures, then obviously more memory is required. So what happens is games developers try to work around designing games with lower amounts of DRAM and games essentially manage them manage the RAM themselves but AMD are trying to convince developers with upcoming graphics card technology that it's actually not a good idea for them to handle the data themselves in fact they believe it's better for the GPU to handle this with HBCC now we have talked about memory management with APIS before uh, APIS by the way with like DirectX 12 uh, Vulkan and with low level functionality so a quick, um, a quick too long didn't read. DirectX 12 has a couple of ways of working. One is the low level, like highly optimized, or two is like almost like a DirectX 11 way of doing things. In other words, it's highly abstracted. In other words, the developers don't really need to worry about coding uh, to the metal or anything like that. But if you do decide to start delving, you have to start worrying about memory heaps, clearing things, making sure you don't get like, you know, um, memory corruption and basically it's a lot easier to cause crashes or memory leaks and that type of thing because you're essentially trying to program from the ground up. AMD believe that it's actually better for their drivers to just go in, handle everything and uh, basically allocate memory as and when. Once again we discussed this quite in depth in the Scott Wasson video and I know I keep saying that but I don't want to go over old ground if you've already seen that by all means you can check the the uh, interview out it's pretty cool at least in my opinion but we talked a lot about like The Witcher 3 and Fallout and uh, how memory allocation changes with this particular game and it's like what basically happens is that The Witcher 3 for example over allocates memory so basically 50% more data is being allocated on a typical scenario than what's actually really being accessed. The memory simply just gets gobbled up by the particular game. And this is not like they're running at, I don't know, low resolution or whatever. They were running, let's say, Fallout 4 or The Witcher 3 with ultra settings at 4K, which means realistically that's pretty memory intensive scenarios. So future GPUs, according to AMD, are better at man managing and data themselves. But obviously, so ultimately, what does all of this mean? Well, it's likely going to take a while before we even realize what type of impact most of this has on games. 
And according to Scott Wasson and AMD themselves, they've admitted that we're probably not going to get the full benefit of this anytime soon in games, simply because developers are not developing, if that is a thing, um, around this particular technology. So it really comes down to essentially what developers decide to do. Um, so I'm talking quite generic terms here, but it's really going to come down to other things with the GPU, probably in the short term, uh, and by short term, I mean like the next 6 to 12 months after the card's released. Which are going to make the positive impact in performance. So whether that's clock speed, whether that's optimization, whether that's better memory compression, which obviously means that it's going to be better at shunting data around the local memory. Those type of things are going to make a difference. Now, obviously, AMD can do levels of optimization on their drivers. And if they can do that, or developers decide to release patches to better utilize the architecture, then that's going to be great. We also know that this type of... Um, stuff that they're already talking about like the Witcher 3 that's going to be something that will impact you now and therefore possibly GPUs from the Vega lineup and I say GPUs from the Vega lineup rather than saying the Vega lineup because ultimately we don't know which of these cards are going to have HBCC like whether it's going to be present in let's say the cards that have GDDR5 memory we just don't know I could make some guesses but there would be at best, an educated guess, and at worst, just totally, just totally wrong. So we just don't know, like, what's compatible, what they're working on, that type of stuff. What we do know is that the cards themselves are going to be shaking up the market a little bit, but don't forget AMD are not just focused on, you know, how many frames per second you get in the latest games. They are also worried about data center stuff, which is one of the reasons that they are putting this technology together. So, yes, of course, they're also looking to appeal to gamers because naturally, why wouldn't they? And the technology does filter. So, in other words, something that improves frame rates can also generally improve things at the data center like higher clock speeds it's not it's not like if you go from a piece of silicon that's got like let's say 1400 megahertz and you crank it to 1600 megahertz it's not like it's going to have an adverse effect in one application is it but we just don't know how much of a difference it's going to make and unfortunately the biggest problem the biggest hurdle we have with vega well is a couple first of all scott wasson admitted to me and and you know publicly uh, during the interview that there is multiple things on the Vega architecture that they have not told us. In other words, they're still holding a lot of surprises back. Obviously, he can't tell me, well, actually, it was a bit like this surprise we're not telling us, so we don't know what it is. He did say that they did cherry-pick some of the bigger stuff, so there is a lot of stuff that there might be a couple of big surprises and a whole bunch of smaller changes. In fact, he basically said that there are so many changes in the Vega architecture, it's actually quite difficult for him to even think of what they've changed because so much has changed. Now, I'm not saying that to sell you the graphics card. Ultimately, I'm going to tell you, don't buy a damn thing until you've seen benchmarks. Just like any card, just like any processor, just like any SSD or whatever. But it's going to be a very interesting for gamers and you know, high-performance enthusiasts alike. The only question which I'm sure is on everyone's lips right now, is, well, what ha are what are NVIDIA going to do to counter? And what are we as gamers going to be doing? Um, you know, what are we going to be getting in terms of our lineup? And we just don't know because AMD are being very tight-lipped when it comes to product lineup. They didn't even really want to admit it was a Vega 10 that was actually running on the sh show floors. And it was kind of an accident that Rajak had already said it. And after he said it, it was kind of like, well, I can't really go back on that. Ellery did try to hide it a little bit. It was like, it was too late at that point. And to be honest, the silicon is so freaking early with Vega I wouldn't even be surprised if they don't even know what products are available. In fact, they did kind of admit that as well, that they're not sure really what the final products of Vega are going to be. Obviously, they have an idea what products they want, but until they're actually testing the silicon, they just don't really know how it's going to come into play. So all this memory stuff is really cool, um, but for gamers, we just don't know what impact it's going to have yet. So hopefully that's answered some people's questions anyway. So take care of yourselves. Bye for now.